Hello? Hi. Hi, welcome everybody. It's so great to see you this evening. Um, I was just thinking it's like zero to 60 in the School of Art, of Art and Art History. We've got so much going on this week. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I wanted to just say a couple of thank yous before we begin Brody's lecture. Um, uh, we, of course, want to acknowledge and uh, thank uh, the Macy's Visiting Artist Endowment, uh, which makes this lecture possible. Uh, we'd also like to thank Dean Ron Jones, who uh, believes wholeheartedly in our Visiting Artist Program, and we thank him for his support. Um, of course, we'd like to thank Wally Wilson, and uh, Wally has organized a wonderful reception um, with Gloria's help this evening, um, which will follow Brody's talk at 8 o'clock, and it'll be just outside um, over in the breezeway. So I hope you brought your woolly jumper and can stick around a bit. Um, uh, we'd also like to thank Margaret Miller um, and uh, the staff at Graphic Studio, and Don Fuller in particular, and Kristen, sort of, uh, for their help with uh, uh, getting uh, Brody's technical needs taken care of. Don's also been hosting uh, uh, Brody this week and, uh, over at Graphic Studio, helping, helping him get settled over there. A special thanks, though, to Gloria Quigley, who uh, really coordinates a lot of the details with our visiting artists. And I know she put in a lot of time and effort this evening to arrange the reception afterwards. So thank you, Gloria. Um, so uh, I, I also want to make note of uh, a, an artist talk that will take place tomorrow evening. Uh, the Werner Reiter artist talk will take place at 3.30 in FEH 290. And so we hope you can come by for that lecture. And uh, that talk will be given in connection with the exhibition uh, that's about to open at the Contemporary Art Museum tomorrow. Um, and the reception for that exhibition begins at 7 p.m. And it includes the faculty focus exhibition with works by uh, Neil Bender, Elizabeth Condon, and Cesar Conejo. Um, and lastly, a plug for a project that's happening downtown this weekend. Um, some of you may know that uh, the Lights on Tampa uh, uh, event is taking place downtown this weekend, and there are a number of uh, big projects going to be uh, 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 getting underway tomorrow night. The first sort of kickoff event is at the Fort Brook parking garage at 5.30, and that'll be a several stories high projection onto the garage. And um, there'll be a lot of other interesting things. I just heard something on WUSF this evening about Will Pappenheimer's project, uh, which will be a giant mood ring. So I hope you can get down to see that. And then um, a selfish plug, uh, there's a, a, a separate satellite project that will be over in um, Channel Side that's been curated by myself and uh, Sean Cheatham. And there'll be 10 artists, many of them are USF alumni or even current students, um, but there are also some uh, artists who have come from uh, New York. And so we hope you come down and see that. That starts at six. And I'll have maps of, of that project over at the Contemporary Art Museum tomorrow um, during the opening. Um, so it's really a thrill to introduce Brody tonight. Um, he, uh, many of you might remember him from the fall semester when his works were shown in the wonderful Audience and Avatar exhibition curated by Don Fuller at the Contemporary Art Museum, which was just voted Best Exhibition of 2008 by Megan Voller, who's here with us tonight. Um, we're so happy to be able to bring Brody back this semester um, he's been here all week, working very hard over at Graphic Studio to develop a series of prints. And um, he's also been meeting with our graduate students in their seminar classes, and um, they've been dragging him out for beers afterwards, I hear. 
Um, I first met Brody when we were both students at the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, and uh, uh, Brody uh, was sort of at his, the tail end of his time there, and I was just beginning. And Brody uh, was, he was an undergraduate just finishing up, and I was a first year terrified graduate student. And um, it was so clear that he was going on to great things. I remember him taking part in a critique at Blank Space. And, um, uh, and then before you knew it, he was gone and off to great things. Um, he was also a member of the Cloud Seeding Circus for the Performative Object. And uh, when I was teaching at Western Michigan University, I invited the circus to come and perform there and uh, uh, it was probably your chilliest show of the whole tour, I bet. It was freezing. It wasn't? <laughs> um, and uh, actually, two of his colleagues from the circus are doing projects in Channelside this weekend. So it's kind of a reunion of a weekend. Um, Brody's work is uh, uh, wonderfully uh, textured and um, interesting work. He, mix, he mixes contemporary art strategies with game development technologies, subcultural communities, and cultural criticism. His work's layered, often dark, often informed by trauma, and his own experiences of current events. It's also probably informed by apocalyptic fascinations. Um, he has had solo exhibitions at the Santa Monica Museum of Art in California, Virgil de Valder uh, Gallery in New York, at The Kitchen in New York, and his work's been included in the Whitney Biennial and at exhibitions at the New Museum in New York. Tonight, he's going to talk about a project he completed last summer um, for the Sonspeak International Public Sculpture Exhibition, and I think you'll really enjoy his talk tonight. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, let's please welcome Brody Conan. Wendy. I'll try to stay on schedule. Um, this, we have about an hour. Um, this will be a little rambling because this is the first lecture that I've done on this project. So I'm still trying to understand. The project is called 25-fold manifestation. Um, like she said, it was a part of the Sans Beak 2008 public sculpture exhibition um, in Holland and uh, over the summer. So I'm s there's so much information that, that uh, and work that went into this project. It's sort of, uh, I'm still trying to understand how to transfer that, how to bring that over to you. So <clears throat> let's try. Um, before I go on to that, if Wendy said there might be some people who um, weren't clear about uh, what I did in the past. If you saw the CAM exhibition, you have a really great idea. Um, but uh, this, and she made a great summary of it. I mean, you can describe it as performance, sculpture, moving image pieces that utilize the visual styles and elements from computer games um, and live game subcultures. Um, and, you know, they often include these sort of ongoing, repetitive movement, um, uh, whether it's live or in a game space, um, and thematically are kind of held together by these different notions of various types of projection of self, or projection of self out of your body in, in contemporary culture. Um, keep in mind I came out of a sculptural background, uh, not tech or design. So. Um, I began my work uh, sort of in early in Florida with these ritualistic endurance performances uh, within installation environments. And sort of that still carries on today. Um, and at some point in the mid to late 90s, I just began, to, there's no mystery, you know, it's very clear. I just began to combine elements from the cultural products from my history that I knew best. Um, computer games, role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, and mixing that with contemporary art strategies, mostly from 60s uh, onward. It's, you know, it's fairly clear. And then some of the 
more recent products of that are large pieces. This is a game modification. Um, it's a modification of existing computer game, Unreal 2003. And these are installed, projected in spaces, and they run off of small computers uh, continuously. So um, essentially, the camera is moving through an infinite pink space with the Elvises flying out at you. Um, and, and doing this movement in between death and dancing infinitely, the magic elvi. They're installed in spaces like this. This is one of the pieces of baptism uh, from the uh, cam show, a different installation shot. And um, that gives you a fairly clear idea of, of, the, of the digital work. So I'm going to go ahead and... And, and then it also, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I missed a couple pieces from, from the cam show I want to jump to before we jump on. Let's see what we have here. Don't see it, so I'm not going to show that. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and screen uh, the video from the most recent project. So because it, it speaks for itself much better than I'm speaking right now, obviously. Um, so, and the piece is called 25-Fold Manifestation. Uh, this is the first uh, screening um, that I've done of the piece. It's not, <clears throat> I'm still working out the bugs. Um, it's a piece that's sort of combining fantasy live action role playing um, or the LARP subculture, which I work with to make this project, uh, public sculpture, ritualistic performance art, um, and it was a series of you know, very physically and psychologically intense live games. There were about 80 players over the course of the summer. Um, and the, uh, there were five events that evolved over the course of the summer. Um, and it was a live action role playing game that was set in a distant future where civilization as we know it had been lost. And players from different worlds, uh, they met deep in this holy forest of Sonspeak and inhabited a 40-foot high tower that I designed. Uh, and they stayed there in character for three days at a time, uh, eating, sleeping, um, waking up, living in character in this space. And during that time, they were worshiping invented deities that were embodied by all of the other artworks in the exhibition. And so I think it's just best to, to show that. Oh. 
So, um, so who here knows what a LARP is? I should pronounce. Who here knows what a LARP is? Or a live action role playing game? Several people. Okay, so a fair amount of people in the audience. Um, it's, it's kind of a hard phenomenon to describe if you haven't seen it. Um, it's, so, keep in mind, it's a kind of improvisational performance based on a set of rules. Um, and what you probably know most, um, let's see, is something like, something like this. Let's go to, ah, I need to find a good part for you. Oh yeah, here we go. This is actually a, a live action role playing event uh, called Cauldron, usually has about over 300 people. They stay uh, over a weekend. Um, this is generally indicative of a lot of the American fantasy LARPs. Yeah. He's your buddy right there. Sort of buffer LARPs or, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons fantasy based. Uh, Latex weapons, spells, you get the idea. I love those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not involved with this at all, but during my period of research, this was the kind of events I was going to or watching. Yeah. Yeah, you got about enough of that. Um, I love that stuff. So it's, you know, so before I go into the details of, uh, of the 25-fold game um, performance, whatever you want to call it, uh, I want to just give a brief overview of, of you know, LARPs or lives, uh, live-action role-playing games or lives for short, um, and uh, specifically concerning the Nordic role-playing scene. The players that I worked with, the game designer that I worked with, um, uh, although were, let's say the core players were from the Nordic countries. They were either Scandinavian, somebody from Norway, uh, I mean there's Swedish, Norwegian, uh, mostly uh, Danish. Um, and, uh, and then there were s uh, some German crews, but they're, and then mostly Dutch. Um, so Dutch is about 10 years behind the Nordic scene, and then, uh, or the Dutch scene is about 10 years behind the Nordic scene, and then the uh, American LARPs are about uh, about 20 years behind. 
Um, although that doesn't mean there, that there aren't things buried out there in the wild that I haven't seen yet, but for the most part. Um, and someone in one of the classes uh, I visited recently asked me sort of why is American role playing 20 years behind the Nordic scene? Um, and that, there are reasons for that. And, and to, to answer that, I have to go back into LARP history in a way. And again, I just chose a few um, Nordic games just run by friends. I can't, you know, there's no time at all to do a history. There are hundreds and hundreds of games going on up there, and they're all pretty amazing. So, um, you know, the, the place, and before I even go up to, uh, up to Denmark, up to Copenhagen, I have to start here. You know, so, um, so uh, I, I assume most of you are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, um, and you're mostly familiar with scenes like this, of uh, you know goons standing around playing with miniatures, um, and uh, I was one of those, and then the dungeon master sitting at the head of the table and guiding this uh, kind of interactive story um, between uh, that happens you know spontaneously uh, between two to ten people um, and the physics of that world the rules of that world are based on sort of complex tombs of knowledge that you accumulate over time um, and this was this was actually a piece I did at an art fair in LA called uh, lawful evil um, we played Dungeons and Dragons for about eight hours uh, at the art fair um, and uh, with all uh, lawful evil characters sort of um, sort of the the alignment that we as, that we as sort of felt permeated the art fair because um, there's kind of this uh, one large part is this uh, moral system of Dungeons and Dragons uh, where you have you lay out uh, the focus of your character from neutral in in between things chaotic evil sort of crazy and evil lawful evil sort of uh, following all the rules being a very good lawyer um, uh, but with evil intentions and of course you see the others chaotic good lawful good um, and <clears throat> And, it's, and if you have that base, you can start to understand um, what happened in the 1980s. Uh, when I, well, let's say 1985, um, you know, even, at, even in our teens, you know, we were ready to take that material, to take those games and bring them out into the environment you know, with a, a, a trash can shield and a cardboard tube as a sword. But of course, at that time, that was essentially illegal, especially in the Midwest, because that was the, those were the years um, where, which were the satanic cult is going to kill your children years, and it was, uh, and they, it was spread all over the, so especially over the Midwest. Parents found out I played Dungeons and Dragons, they would kick me out of their house. So there was this sort of fundamentalist Christian culture that made this activity that I wanted to, um, uh, that I wanted to get involved in and stay involved in and take further, essentially illegal. And that's what's amazing for me to be able to do these pieces now. Um, and you also have you know, a stronger focus on reenactment in the states. So, but you didn't necessarily have those limitations in the Nordic countries and Northern Europe as much. They're still there though. Um, and then of course, you, know, you jump to games like Vampire, um, so, if you have any goth kids on campus, you've probably, which I'm sure you do, it's Tampa, you've probably seen plenty of games of Empire at night somewhere out in the park. So it starts to become more about a kind of uh, dialogue between characters instead of this sort of random fighting. Um, and the richness of the role play starts to show up. And you know, once you do that for about 10 years, you start to get extremely bored, or some people do, so, uh, if you play the same character for 10 years especially. Um, so then what started, what started to happen in the Nordic countries, they, you, they make, started to make genre shifts. They go to sci-fi game, they go to a, uh, they go to a Wild West game. 
Um, they go to bigger fantasy games, bigger and better, 500 people, huge wars, uh, huge uh, smoke and light filled columns that demons run out of, you know, um, at a midnight when they're all sleeping, a demon runs out and starts killing everybody. And then it's, no, 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 next time, 20 demons run out. You know, so it's like, it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, and, and then there was this, about 99, the, um, if you remember the Dogma 95 Manifesto by Lars von Trier, uh, Lars von Trier uh, in Copenhagen. So they, they're in the same community. Lars von Trier is making films utilizing live action role playing strategies like the idiots. Um, role players are looking at that and keep in mind a lot of the role playing community is uh, there at that time, no art education, no film education, no theater education, totally self taught. But they're taking the Dogma 95 manifesto and applying it to LARPing and saying we're tired, you know, we're tired of these fantasy LARPs, we're going to do sort of these vows of chastity for LARPing, meaning no simulation anymore. So a plastic, a foam sword is a foam sword. It's not a real sword. Nothing, everything only represents itself. If you throw a bag of flour at someone and say sleep or magic spell, you know, it's a, a fireball. It's just somebody throwing a bottle, bag of flour at you. So if you hit somebody, you have to hit them. If you have sex with them in the game, you have to have sex with them. So there's a kind of um, that's one of the change. Uh, no genre, so no science fiction and fantasy genre LARPs anymore. Um, no pre-constructed narratives, so the, the dungeon master, game master, whatever you want to call them, game designer, can't have intervention at any point within the game. He can only, he or she can only set up situations and then let them run um, <clears throat> and and so so they're standing around saying what what do we do now you know like how do you start, what games do you make at that point so then all kinds of random things started to show up like ring and in sweden um, 30 people renting a large house um, staying in it for three days and all playing characters from the 70s uh, and living as a commune in the 70s. So uh, sort of a 70s reenactment, if you might say, but playing characters and living as a commune for three days. Um, then you have something like a larger piece, System Denmark. Um, they built, uh, this is in the middle of, this, of Copenhagen. Um, it was a game about, with about 350 people. I think it lasted for three days. I don't think it was five. Everybody uh, stayed in. Um, it's the, they built a city. It was about an 80,000 euro project. They built a city out of shipping containers. Um, it was a pseudo-futuristic city where uh, it was basically a slum and the players were trapped uh, essentially inside the slum and had to consistently you know, always in character, sleeping on the street at times, it's freezing cold, um, trying to find food, uh, and consistently dealing with the, bureau the bureaucratic system of that futuristic space of trying to get jobs. They would go meet uh, people like this who are also other players. They would have to go through psychological counseling, which is all improvised. Um, it's a pretty amazing or smaller personal pieces. Uh, this is Bjarke here. He was one of the game designers that assisted me with uh, 25 fold. So this kind of, they, <clears throat> the game was called The White Road. Uh, there are five players and they did a sort of, uh, they reenacted um, or recreated this uh, subculture, which is very famous in Copenhagen, called the Road Knights, which have a very strict rules of living. Um, they push around baby carriages, they dress in this way, they can never accept charity from people, and they wander around the countryside. So they pretended to be Road Knights, and the LARP was them walking from Copenhagen to the sea. Um, and that's, it goes on and on, so mixing. Uh, he also did a game called U359, where he found an authentic Russian sub, 
uh, I think 30 to 50 people lived in the sub, the dry dock sub, for three days at a time. It was wired for sound. They had authentic Navy uniforms from Russia from that period in the 60s. It sort of played out this interactive drama throughout that period. Some people cleaned clothes, some people ran the galley, but there was always these intense and emotional interactive dramas happening. Um, <clears throat> so that, that, in a way, is why the Nordic Sea has kind of has passed up the American scene. They moved into this position where it's almost become performance art. And now, of course, they're definitely um, rolling into performance art. At the same time, you still have the older games. So the way that they'll make money and fund their other projects is do something like this. So they do six of these games per month with three, about 300 kids each time. Um, this is in Copenhagen where you can buy LARP swords in the supermarket. Um, and uh, it's supported by... Uh, cultural institutions across the board. Art cultural institutions give them money uh, for some LARPs, um, although they have to push a sort of more socially, uh, let's say, critical agenda. Um, uh, schools support these LARPs, uh, churches, it's all over the place because they know their kids want to play games, but they know they also want them outside doing something and it builds up teamwork, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you have older groups doing more mature war LARPs still. Uh, but sort of stripping, this is based on the, the tabletop miniature game, uh, Warhammer. So I think this was, uh, sev could have been five to seven hundred people running uh, extremely large wars. But less about role playing and more about strategy. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's just the, the context in which these players are coming to me. Um, and I'm learning more from them than I think I, I'm getting more from them than I have to, than I have to offer. Um, just in terms of the unbelievable amount of craft they have revolving around interactive performance, knowing exactly what's going to happen uh, in terms of Bjarka, the game designer, when it's an unbelievable craft, when they're watching two people in the woods late at night, um, one person is on sort of this path of activity and another person is on this path of activity, and if you choose to, in and if you choose to intervene, he can tell you what the three options are. He can tell you three options of exactly what they're gonna do. If you say this at this time, or if you intervene and say this. Um, so people are fairly predictable. <clears throat> um, so that's, that's, I would say that's, that's fairly clear. Um, and it's one of my stated goals to try and shift those strategies and seed that into the American scene in a way because it's been buried there for so long. <clears throat> Um, I'll switch over and now talk about the Sonsbeek exhibition, so, <clears throat> um, yeah. So this is, imagine, hold on one second, let's see. So it was in Arnhem in the Netherlands, so what you have is a large park there called the Sonsbeek, <clears throat> uh, Sonsbeek Park. It's about two miles by one mile wide. Um, you know, you have a uh, great exhibition curated by Anna Till Rowe with artists like Matthew Monaghan and El Ansui from Nigeria, uh, these huge bubbles by Thomas Saraceno. Um, so you essentially have this huge playground to start to interact with. Um, and <clears throat> so there's an anthropologist on staff that was able to connect us to uh, the LARPing community in Holland. Uh, which was still mostly based on the fantasy LARPs that I showed you earlier, like Cauldron. Um, and we were able to come in and start to see these sort of progressive live performance uh, ideas throughout the community. Um, and as an aside, uh, the exhibition was already in term, in a very community-based in terms of there was a thousand uh, 
people from the community uh, formed guilds to support each artwork and carry the artwork through the city before it went to the park. That was, it was an amazing experience. But this was one of the, uh, this is the sort of live piece, the throne that was carried through the city. And then, of course, all the other artworks followed <clears throat> or were in front of me. Um, and the question for us was how to, immediately how to take these players from Holland that have a very specific knowledge about how they like to play, what they like to see. Um, and Monica Traxel uh, from Copenhagen designed these amazing workshops, performance workshops, some taking, uh, of course, taking some uh, elements from theater workshops, but essentially they were divinity experience workshops um, through this sort of uh, repetitive motions um, and meditations, uh, sort of getting them in touch with a particular feeling or a particular emotion that we were driving them towards in the game. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you consider at this point, what I'm trying to do is, all I want to see is uh, this kind of repetitive motion performances um, around, in, or with this other sculptures in the park. Um, because my base, in a sense, coming out of sculpture and performance and installation is someone like Anne Hamilton, sort of the body is sculpture, uh, you know, performing around with or in sculptural environments and leaving behind a kind of residue. So if you take Anne Hamilton and just smash that with Dungeons and Dragons, you sort of get what I was looking for. And I could have easily hired actors, um, but in this sense, it was able to think procedurally about the performance. Um, meaning, in the same way that I modify the existing computer games, I could sort of take what they already do and then modify that and create a kind of performative game engine that spits out random performances in the park. Um, and somehow, you know, piece by piece kind of manipulate that process so that these random performances uh, become ritualistic and repetitive. And that, that sort of shows itself in how we design the game. So, and I'll show you a bit of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what we start with generally sort of um, and that's actually what's amazing for me is, is you, I begin to do exactly what I was doing when I was about 14, which was, um, which was make player guides, make character guides, to send out, make our own players' manuals. Um, so all of those, uh, all of that work that I put in at that time, um, working on this thing that most people thought was essentially useless at that time, if not satanic, sort of came into play. Um, so here's the park, here's the, here's the tower. So the first thing you lay out is a sort of the game world. And it's kind of, um, you have to make a reason for them to be there, a reason for them to be worshiping. And in a sense, the game world for me is almost, uh, it's almost just a wrapper, sort of push these performances. It's almost arbitrary. Uh, like most games, it's sort of an arbitrary to drive act, the sort of World War II rapper, the steampunk rapper, whatever rapper that is, aesthetic rapper, is just a tool to drive action, to drive interaction. Um, so here was where we describe this kind of, this park that's a separate plane of existence that all of these people from other worlds come, come to to sort of worship these uh, group called the Immortals, and the Immortals in, are embodied in all of those sculptures. Um, and then you lay out the base for this idea of a nation, and the idea, the ideas of technology. Technology is not invented, but it comes from the Immortals. Um, this sort of uh, 
sculptures as representations of immortals, the spirits. Um, each element that's, that they're going to see within that world has to be consistent so that they can stay in character for that period of time without being to, in a totally immersed space, without being uh, jarred out of it. So every outside element is going to jar them out of their character because it's not an actor pretending to be someone. It's somebody doing their best over a period of days to embody a kind of a, uh, an emotion they're interested in and a new role for themselves that they're interested in. Um, and the, the biggest problem is, uh, well, the biggest problem for the LARP industry, for the LARPers as a whole, is documentation. How do you document these things? You know, what, what happens when you have a camera and you're supposed to be in the Middle Ages? That uh, doesn't help your immersion in any way whatsoever. Um, how do you uh, deal with viewers? Because it's totally hermetic. So there are all these amazing things are, problem, are happening, and they're speaking to each other, but they're not speaking to us. They're not um, letting that material out. And it only comes out in sort of cheesy documentaries, making fun of, like, uh, making fun of adults in costume hitting each other with foam weapons. Um, so the, the way we dealt with viewers in the park, because there were 40,000 viewers over the course of the summer, I think, and uh, we, uh, they were in this plane of existence, they were dead people from the past, and sort of waiting to cross over into the realm of the immortals. They're ghosts, and the players can't speak with or interact with or touch those ghosts. Um, and so that's what you saw when you saw them holding mirrors in front of the tower. Um, and trying to keep the ghosts out of the tower. Because art viewers are actually pretty horrible um, in that particular case. Uh, so they, I just left mirrors around and then they just started. I didn't know how they were going to keep people out of the tower. I just told them that they needed to keep them out of this place they were living in the park. Um, and they ended up holding mirrors, chanting, screaming. Um, all the viewers wanted inside the tower, and some would come at them and try to push them out of the way and scream at them. And so there were these constant um, points of contact that would generate ra other random performances. Um, and they, uh, Especially uh, the journalists in the opening were extremely pissed. They would sort of be standing in front of the tower trying to get in, get into the sculpture. Um, and there would be these uh, people in unbelievable uh, costumes and goggles and horns and weapons and yelling at them to get out, you know. And, uh, and they would just walk away totally disgusted. Like, they didn't perform for me. Like, so um, I was like, what just happened? So there are constantly these points where their immersion in this other world was starting to break down, but they were holding on to it so tightly. Um, and <clears throat> but and then so we don't tell them what the nation is, what their nation is. We don't tell them what their character is. We give them a character type. Um, you know, gives very very loose rules in terms of weapons. You know, there there are bands of five basically, and they're ritual masters, band leaders, archivists, duel masters, heralds, and then this sort of us in the background, slightly pushing things back and forth through the forest guardians. And so this is a document given to me by one of the groups, the Dutch groups that was joining. Uh, their group was, their uh, group was called the Ferrandi. And so, of course, they built long nation backgrounds. Um, how, they deal with, how they deal with magic, how they deal with rituals, how they deal with the gods. They live on this thing called tree blood, which they're constantly injecting into themselves. Descriptions of, you know, detailed descriptions of each character. So, um, you can see the amount of, the amount of detail that goes in. Um, and, <clears throat> and then it's also providing an environment that not only has this kind of uh, practical facilities, where do you eat, where do you sleep, where do you uh, go to the bathroom, but also 
something that uh, has to be sculpturally sound and architecturally sound in this case. So um, in this particular case, I started with this kind of simple, almost modernist structure, which they slowly added small details to. So these are the sketches that I do for these structures. And then they would live in small coffin hotels and eat yeah, <laughs> every day we would give them food in this kind of uh, food procession. The, food, the gods would leave them pigs and things out sort of in the environment. Sketches that didn't go through, buildings that didn't happen, but that was the, orig so the original idea. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, and I think I think that's enough detail right now for sure um, on that piece. And I'm still, <clears throat> and we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to do is just open up to questions on that. If at all. a good question. Um, that's me. <laughs> uh, and I usually had a camera. I usually had a camera and I didn't speak. Um, I only spoke through a small um, chaos pad that made sounds like <laughs> yeah. Um, because I didn't want to get involved as a character at all. But I was the kind of uh, the forest guardians and there were five of us and we were the people that sort of pushed them in one direction or another and, and were um, uh, got them things if they needed it. They were all parts of a body. There was the heart, soul. I was the eye, and I just stood and watched um, with the HD cam. I would follow them places uh, and try to catch rituals. The thing is, there was so much happening in the park at any given time because the, the five groups, it was 30 people at a time, and the five groups would spread out. I essentially noticed very quickly that I was missing most of it. You know, I have hours, I don't know, you know, I don't know, I might have 100 hours of footage, but, you know, that video was, was the best of it. Um, so eventually we, we brought in someone else who also played a character, but sat very quietly around them. And eventually they became comfortable with that character's presence, and they, that character, the videographer would follow them to rituals. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's the various parts. So if you have, uh, you know, immediately you can think of what I said before, like Anne Hamilton and these kind of perform repetitive performances, you know, in and around sculptures and sculptural installations. Uh, D&D obviously precede this idea of kind of procedural performances, D&D and live games. Um, Andrea Zettel, uh, sort of this building up of new communities and alternative lifestyles, but then kind of, um, but pushing that into more into fantasy, you know, um, and especially you know 60s and 70s performance art, and this idea of the documentation of the performance later being kind of the piece, and um, and in terms of film, Punishment Park by Peter Watkins it was a film he made. I think it was the late 60s, where. Um, he set up this, he set up, essentially set up a live game where he um, brought in actors and activists um, and <clears throat> he, they all knew they were going to be picked up at a certain point, but they didn't know exactly what was going to happen. There was no scripting. Um, maybe they had a general idea. And they were picked up uh, in an army truck from their houses and then uh, the film starts, they're being brought out into the desert and then they're brought into tents. And there are members of the community there, they're not actors. And the activists and the squares, if you want to call them that, were ha they had a discussion first about, you know, the war was still going on and they were considered dissidents, that's why they were brought there. 
and they had the choice. They were given a choice to either go to federal prison or go through Punishment Park. And so they had uh, cops, some of them uh, real cops, and National Guard that um, uh, there was this issue where, or, or it started out where they had to run um, to the American flag at this other point in the desert without being caught by the cops. And so then that kind of game started. And the, uh, Peter was just there with a camera following them around. Some parts were, you know, they seemed a little scripted or they would at least sit and talk to the camera. They were more functioning as actors, but it was open and unscripted. Yeah, so with this extremely heavy political content. Yeah. Or von Trude, the idiots. Yeah. So new filmmaking strategy, yeah, for sure. That involves um, procedural performance. Punishment Park? Oh no, that was in LA. Yeah, it's in the death. Punishment Park. Um, are you saying Punishment Park or me, or or this or the Song Speak exhibition or the the. LARPs in general, um, not necessarily. I mean, we had this. We had the support of. We have the you know the sort of support of the exhibition, and that was kind of the biggest thing happening in the city at that time. Um, normally, the LARPers, yes. Um, I mean, if you're running around at night with fake weapons, you generally have problems with the police. Uh, yeah. So, and there's a, there's a whole variety of problems that go on with that activity, but it's generally revolves around mistaken identity, you know, yeah. Were there other legal problems you were thinking about or, or issues? Liability, yeah, well they sign a form, you know, they can't sue me if they fall off the tower, yeah. Yeah, well, that's an issue with the viewers. Um, that The viewers, I can't say. We didn't have any particular issues except them getting really pissed off. Um, and in terms of liability, I mean, the city had to approve the tower because people are s sleeping there. I mean, it's a public project, so you get, you get into all kinds of other um, civic issues and you know, sort of ordinances and things like that. But in terms of... Years, it's the same for any exhibition. Somebody walks into CAM, I don't know, and they fall, trip over an art piece and break their head open. What happens, Don? They, they, they hang you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it would be much worse here. As we start to, as I start to do projects here, it is a lot. Uh, there is that fear more, which I. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, I totally support that, and I'm not going to disrespect that at all. Um, but for my personal practice, I generally work with subcultural communities and self-taught communities, or, uh, you know, and this is one of the most exciting sort of performative folk art communities, and I have a, you know, um, and because of that, there are less borders in a way, um, and I, I feel like what you're describing is maybe, you know, um, pervasive game uh, as marketing, um, like I Love Bees campaign um, by Jane McGonigal, I think that's her name, 
Um, uh, that was an ad for, it was a uh, sort of live pervasive game uh, where people were given challenges uh, based off a website. Um, uh, it was an ad for Halo, I think, something like that. Um, so those are getting more and more common. So uh, the marketing, at, using it for marketing was a problem that, that I had. Um, but although, you know, other people are more welcome to do it. Or what you see is sort of new media programs, I guess, across the country in, in an academic setting. Um, laying out, uh, you know, in live game design classes, if you want to call them that, or I guess that would be pervasive gaming as well, or there are other names, I'm sure, that are out there by now. And so um, not being in the academic environment and not, you know, not in marketing, um, I, you know, I naturally gravitate to what I see as a, uh, I'm not a game designer. Um, I work with the game designer. You know, the game design is a craft. I'm more interested in um, using this practice as an example of contemporary folk art and ritual and projection into other spaces, you know, and to generate performances. Yeah. It's, it's twofold. I mean, there's, um, you know, I was essentially make, consciously making two different projects, one for me and the players, and then one for the art audience. And, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people that came through, and I imagine their viewing experience um, very consciously as kind of wandering through the park and seeing wildlife in the park except in this case it was some guy with writing all over his body, twirling a pool noodle and like uh, chanting something, you know? And nobody that came had the same experience. Sometimes they'd see nothing. Sometimes nobody would be there. Or sometimes they'd see somebody walking off into the distance like seeing a deer or spotting a bird. Or sometimes they would just be sitting and 20 people would come and do a hour long ritual in front of them. Um, and it changed for the viewers every time. I mean, imagine walking through the park. These guys were here chanting, doing a duel where they were holding the stick. Um, and the first person to drop the stick lost. Uh, they were from two opposing um, uh, groups, uh, nations. And they sat here for six and a half hours, chanting without leaving. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what viewers thought of that, but most of the viewers also had a guide, the exhibition guide, which is kind of their user manual, teaching them how to view the piece. You know, step back, watch, don't try to intervene. I mean, they know they always did try to intervene, but eventually they would get it and they would sit back and watch. So there was like an amazing variety of experience for the viewers. Yeah, and each time they saw something, it was totally unique. I like that a lot, so, yeah. drive off the ghosts that were trying to get into the tower. Yeah. Maybe even a what? You know, a sequel. A sequel. Yeah. Um, I mean the whole the whole goal is to try and drive try and do other projects and we're developing them right now uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, one for California in 2010 and then larger ones uh, than that hopefully in the Midwest. And so um, bringing the crew, bringing the crew from uh, Denmark because they're sort of the best LARP production managers and everything that, that I've ever seen. So um, yeah, I mean we 
And that was one of the, also one of the issues in Holland was to change the culture there concerning this activity. The queen, you know, flew in in a helicopter for the opening and she was with the cultural manager, uh, ministers. She walked around and saw each piece. She saw the LARPers. Next time those cultural ministers get a LARP proposal across their desk, they may look twice. Um, we worked with an institution with um, two universities that were nearby who had interactive performance programs, very sort of close to new media programs, who in the beginning when we started to talk were laughing or snickering about their students that LARPed, you know, not knowing that you know, one of their students was, you know, the next year make, making a five-day long steampunk game with 300 people, you know. And like, logistics of that for a 22-year-old are pretty amazing, you know. And uh, so, and so they, and then he, by the time we were done, they had already, the next semester they're going to have our strategy classes or they were going to, he was going to, you know, lead seminars. And so we were able to uh, transform the, Holland's a much smaller country, it's a little easier. But we were sort of able to transform the cultural sort of view of that activity. It was the first game that a lot of the older LARPers, they were in their mid-30s, brought their parents to, to watch. Um, and their parents, you know, I mean, say, like, hey, look at what I've been doing for 10 years. You know, it's art. <laughs> like, um, and, uh, yeah, and their parents could see the catalog and see, you know, and, and so, um, uh, the community here will be, you know, it's a bigger country, it'll be harder to shift. I don't have the sort of direct main line to the, to the sort of cultural apparatus that I do there. Uh, yeah, I want to do travel LARPs with 10 people, sort of land in China our land in the Amazon and then, um, you know, redo uh, Aguirre Wrath of God or something by Werner Herzog, but as a LARP, you know? So I was just asked to go to Peru, actually, to do something like that. So I don't know, you know, that can be, we'll see. You know, there are lots of tons of ideas, lots of fun things to do. <laughs> well, let me answer before I go, Wayne, one more, or do we yeah, have enough time? Maybe one more question, and then, um, and then yeah. we, we can retire outside. There's a, a wonderful reception waiting with food and drinks and music, but maybe we can take one more question and, and oh, yeah. we'll it's, wrap it up. It's pretty late, so yeah, yeah, yeah. funding for the technological side of it. Um, well, this is all low tech, I mean. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, as far as the uh, planning out, the, like, uh, oh, okay. I mean, I do the 3D models on my computer. You know, I, I couldn't do that without the production team from the, the production manager from the exhibition who, um, you know, is connecting me to construction companies and who are building this, you know, 40 foot high scaffolding sculpture. And um, so it's, you know, it's project by project. The, all of the financial support in this case comes from um, comes from the Solnspeak exhibition. So each artist was given a, uh, a you know an artist fee to work with, and that's where the money comes from. For a large project like an eighty thousand euro project like System Denmark, they're given a small bit from the city, um, and then they survive by charging each person three hundred euros or something, and then they ba they break even at the end almost. Thank Brody for his lecture. And and uh, Brody's going to stick around.